Hi there, this is the key for the, the pro unit two progress check, the multiple choice questions. All right, so question number one, which particle diagram shown above best represents the strongest intermolecular force between two ethanol C2H6O molecules? All right, so the strongest intermolecular force is gonna be hydrogen bonding, uh, and that's gonna happen right here. It's gonna be, because you have that OH group right there, there's gonna be hydrogen bonding, and the, the bond is gonna be between the oxygen from one uh, molecule and the hydrogen of a different molecule because the oxygen will be will be negative and the hydrogen will be positive so this is going to be a hydrogen bond right here uh, these over here the with the carbons and the hydrogen this end of the molecule is going to be more nonpolar it's this OH group at the end that's going to be the polar part of it so between this part it's just going to be London dispersion forces so that's going to be pretty weak right there so this is the strongest one so going down to the choices uh, it's going to be diagram two um, because it shows the formation of a hydrogen bond between an H atom bonded to an O atom with the O atom from another molecule. So it's letter C. Okay, number two, the diagram above represents four cations all shown to the same scale. Which cation would be predicted by Coulomb's law to have the strongest ion dipole attraction of water? Well, um, when you have a coulombic force, it's going to be charge over distance. So you want higher charged particles that are smaller so the distance can be minimized. So you want a large, higher charge with a smaller distance. So it should be this magnesium. So Mg positive two because it has the largest charge to size ratio. So again, large charge, small distance, small size means the particles can get closer together and that's gonna maximize your coulombic force. Question three. A solid compound of a group 1 alkali metal and a group 17 halogen element dissolves in water. The diagram above represents one type of solute particle present in the solution. Which of the following identifies the solute particle and best helps explain how the solute particle interacts with water molecules? <clears throat> okay, so group 1 metals form positive ions. Group 17 halogens form negative ions. And then with the water molecules, the oxygen end has a partial negative charge. The hydrogen end has a partial positive charge. So you can see in the diagram that it's, it's the oxygen end that's attracted to this particle right here. So with oxygen end being negative, that means this particle has to have a positive charge. So it's going to be one of the alkali metals. So now we go down to the charges or the choices right here. So the, the Particle is a positive ion, so we know it's either C or D, and the interactions are ion-dipole attractions. Yeah, so when you have an, an ion that's dissolved, it's attracted to the dipole in the water molecule. So these are ion-dipole attractions. So it's letter C is the correct answer. Question number four, uh, we have two different allotropes. Uh, an allotrope is just a, a different version of the same element. In this case, it's phosphorus. Um, these are P4 molecules, and this is just a uh, it's just phosphorus, and it's all connected with a bunch of different different uh, covalent compounds. So it's a big covalent network solid. Okay. So the diagrams above represent two allotropes of solid phosphorus. Which of the following correctly identifies the allotrope with a higher melting point and explains why? Well, for this to melt you just have to break the intermolecular forces between these P4 molecules. For this to melt, you have to separate the phosphorus atoms, so you have to break these covalent bonds. So the covalent bonds are a lot stronger than these intermolecular forces, so this one's gonna have, allotrope two is gonna have the higher melting point. So now we go down to the choices. Um, so we know it's not, letter A because that says allotrope 1. So allotrope 2 because it has covalent bonds between the phosphorus atoms that are stronger than the dispersion forces between the P4 molecules and allotrope 1. So it's letter B is the correct answer. <clears throat> Question number five. The crystal structure of NABR is represented in the diagram above. Which statement correctly compares crystalline NABR solid? And this is what the solid will look like to molten NABR liquid in terms of electrical conductivity. Well, this is the solid form. In, in, when it melts, these ions are free to move around. 
So we go down here, we want to compare uh, the, the conductivity and um, let's see, crystalline NABR contains no freely moving electrons that conduct electric current, whereas electrons flow freely in molten NABR. Um, it's not about the electrons free flowing, it's about the ions that can free flow. So it's not A. Crystalline NABR and molten NABR both contain ions that are held in fixed positions. That's not true. When it's molten, the, the ions are not in a fixed position. They're free to move. Letter C, crystalline NABR and molten NABR both contain Na atoms and transfer electrons to Br atoms in the chemical reaction, thus allowing them to both be good conductors. That's not true. Um, solid ionic compounds are not good conductors, only when they're in the liquid phase or dissolved in water. Letter D, crystalline NABR contains no freely moving electrons to conduct electricity. That is true. Molten NABR is composed of freely moving Na ions and bromide ions, which allow it to be a good conductor of electricity. That is true. That's why ionic solids do not conduct electricity. But when you melt them or dissolve them in water, you have free moving ions that, can, that are good conductors of electricity. So letter D is your answer. Okay, question six, we have diamond and graphite. So the structure of the two allotropes of carbon are represented above. Which of the following statements best helps explain why diamond is much harder than graphite? Well, diamond, it's this covalent network solid where it's this huge macromolecule where you have a carbon is connect, each carbon is connected to four carbon atoms around it. But in graphite, um, you have these layers of carbon atoms that are weakly held together. So this, that makes diamond a very hard, rigid structure, but graphite is softer and those, those layers can slide off of each other. Okay, so it's not A, they're both covalent bonds. Uh, it's not B, they're both covalent bonds. Carbon atoms have in diamond have four covalent bonds, whereas graphite made of layers are held together by relatively weak dispersion forces. The answer is C. Question number seven. A gaseous air fuel mixture in a sealed car engine cylinder has an initial volume of 600 milliliters at one atmosphere. To prepare for ignition of the fuel, a piston moves within the cylinder, reducing the volume of the air fuel mixture to 50 milliliters at a constant temperature. Assuming ideal behavior, what is the new pressure of the air fuel mixture? All right, so volume and pressure are inversely proportional. So if the volume gets cut down from 600 to 50, so it's 1 12th of the original volume, that means the pressure has to go up by a factor of 12. Everything else is staying constant. The amount of gas, the temperature, those other factors are staying constant. So it's going to be letter B, about 12 atmosphere, because the volume of gas mixture decreases by a factor of 12. Question 8. At 10 degrees Celsius, 20 grams of oxygen gas exerts a pressure of 2.1 atmospheres in a rigid 7 liter container. Assuming ideal behavior, so that just means that you can use the ideal gas law equation. If the temperature of the gas was raised to 40 degrees Celsius, which statement indicates the new pressure and explains why? Okay, so <clears throat> the, the volume is staying the same and the amount of gas is staying the same. So what's happening is that the temperature is going from 10 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. So temperature and pressure are directly proportional. If the temperature increases, the pressure also increases. So we know that the, the pressure has to be something greater than 2.1. Okay, so that's going to eliminate A and C. So we know it's either B or D. Okay, now the, to figure out which one is between B and D, when you use the ideal gas law, the temperature has to be in the Kelvin scale. So the, the temperature is not going to increase by four times. It's going to increase by a proportion of 313 to 283. It has to be in the Kelvin scale. So that eliminates letter D, so our answer is going to be B. Okay, so the pressure is going to go up because that temperature is going to go up by that proportion. Question 9. Um, Two sealed rigid 5 liter containers each contain a gas at the same temperature but at a different pressure as shown above. 
So we have oxygen of 0.8 atmospheres, nitrogen at 1 atmosphere. Also shown are the results of transferring the entire contents of container 1 to container 2. So we're going to take the gas that's in here and you're going to transfer it over into this container. So they're both together in that same 5 liter container. So no gases escape during the transfer. Assume ideal behavior. Um, which statement is correct regarding the total pressure of the gases after they are combined? Okay, so I, the, the statement right here, ideal behavior means that the gases aren't going to interact with each other. So that means we can just add together their partial pressures to get the total pressure of the mixtures. That's, that's Dalton's law of partial pressures. So it should be 1.8 atmospheres when you put the two together. So now we go down here. Uh, the total pressure of the gases in the mixture is the sum of the initial pressures of oxygen gas and nitrogen gas because pressure only depends on the total amount of gas when volume and temperature are held constant. So it's letter A. So it's not going to be lower, it's not going to be higher, it's going to be equal to the sum of those original pressures. So letter A. Okay. Diagram 1 and diagram 2. So these are um, representing gas particles and the length of the arrow represents the speed of the particles. So the diagram above uses arrows to represent the speed of gas particles. Which of the diagrams best represents the speed of the particles of a gas at a fixed temperature? Well, um, kinetic molecular theory talks about uh, the movement and the, and the speed of gas particles. Um, it's going to be, they're not going to all be going the same speed. At a certain temperature they have a, an average kinetic energy but the, the particles will go at different speeds. So diagram two is a better representation. So diagram two, because the particles have a variety of different speeds, okay, at all temperatures, there's going to be some particles that are going slow. There's going to be some particles that are going fast. But at higher temperatures, the average is going to be, the average speed is going to be higher. Okay, question 11. The two gas samples represented in the graph above are at the same temperature. Which of the following statements about the gases are correct? Okay, so gas Z is moving faster. It has, uh, the, the peak is shifted to the right. It has a higher average speed. So gas Z has to be moving faster. Since they're both at the same temperature, that means they have the same average kinetic energy. So that means gas Z must be lighter to have that higher average speed. So we can say gas Z has a greater molar mass than gas X. So D is your answer. Question 12. The diagram above shows the distributions of speeds for a sample of O2. Which of the following graphs shows the distribution of speeds for the same sample at a higher temperature? So when you have a higher temperature, you're going to have a higher average speed. So the, the peak should be shifted to the right, and at higher speeds, it's a wider distribution. So it should be something about how I'm drawing with my, with my uh, pointer right there. So it should be shifted to the right and the peak should be lower. So that choice is gonna be letter C right there. Question 13, equal molar samples of CH4 and C2H6 are in identical containers at the same temperature. The C2H6 deviates much more from ideal gas behavior than the CH4 does. Which of the following best helps explain this deviation? Okay, so two assumptions of ideal gas behavior is that the particles uh, do not uh, contain, I'm sorry, the particles do not interact with each other and the particles have no volume. Okay, so if C2H6 deviates more, uh, we have to look for the opposite of that. So we want the particles that have a larger volume and then they interact more. So C2H6 molecules have more hydrogen bonding. Neither of them have hydrogen bonding. They only have one in dispersion, so it's not A. C2H6 molecules have a larger, more polarizable electron cloud. So it's going to be, have a, a stronger London dispersion force. That's going to make it less ideal. Uh, C2H6 molecules have a greater average kinetic energy. No, they don't. They're at the same temperature, so they're going to have the same average kinetic energy. And C2H6 molecules have a greater average speed. That's not true. So it's going to be letter B is the correct answer.